Welcome everyone to Partner Up with Amy Carroll. As a communication coach, trainer, speaker, and author, I'm delighted to be your host and excited to bring you insights and ideas to help you solve your communication conundrums. This is the 26th episode of my show, Partner Up with Amy Carroll. If you want to find out more about me or what the show is about, feel free to listen to previous episodes on my website, carolcoaching.com, or check it out on the voiceamerica.com business channel. Be sure to download the app or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Have you ever wondered how cultural or language differences impact a person's thinking and being in the world? Do you sometimes struggle with getting detached or being able to detach from the outcome? I know I do. If so, be sure to check out my interview from February 19th with Dr. Rima Azam. She's a trained psychologist, educator, and coach. Rima talked about how being multilingual and multicultural has impacted the way she thinks and interacts in the world. In addition, Rima shares insights for managing your inner control freak. Be sure to check out that episode number 25 from February 19th. Today, my guest is Giuseppe Conte. Welcome, Giuseppe. Hello, Hami. Nice talking to you. Yes, great to have you here. Giuseppe, when I think back when we first met, I'm going to guess it was about 10 years ago when I was coaching people at Merrick and you were, the, you were in charge of procurement. Is that right? Absolutely. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. And since Ten years then, ago. yeah, I know our paths have crossed many times. And uh, I was thinking how delightful it was that you accepted my invitation to be talking with me today. So thank you. My pleasure. Now, listeners, we're going to be talking about collaborative negotiations. And after I give you a little background on Giuseppe, you'll see why this is the man for this topic. Now, Giuseppe is the founder of a firm that offers a range of customized training in the field of negotiation and influencing. And since 2005, Giuseppe has been an award-winning lecturer, recognized for his lively and interactive training workshops across a number of leading business schools in Europe. For example, um, HEC, HEC in Lausanne, HEC in Paris, IMD, INSEAD, London Business School, Oxford, and the University of G Geneva. And that's only some of the schools where Giuseppe works. Most recently, he's become a professor in negotiation and influencing and has regular workshops on four continents. Corporate leaders and individuals from more than 110 countries have attended Giuseppe's workshops. Impressive. As an accomplished negotiator, Giuseppe integrates more than 25 years of executive level experience at blue chip corporations, including Procter & Gamble, Novartis, Firminish, and Merck. Now, do I say that, do I pronounce it right, Ferminish? Absolutely. Oh, good. Yes. And it's a, it's a fragrance, fra fragrance yes. company. Yes, uh -huh. the second largest uh, com company in the business of flavor and fragrances, yes. Did you ever get any bonus colognes or perfumes to, that you get? To eh, indeed, you know, as an employee, you can indeed uh, get access to a number of things and also discover a bit more about the exciting words of fragrances, yes. Interesting. Now, Recent research from Giuseppe and articles have been published in the Financial Times, the London Business School Review. And some of these topics focus on negotiating with no alternatives, gender differences in negotiation, and dealing with, this is my personal favorite, dealing with difficult people. <laughs> I think I need that article. <laughs> now, Giuseppe, I have to say, so far, what I when I review this your background, I think, what an interesting career. And I think this is the first time I see a former business executive who ends up teaching at so many world-class business schools. How did you build this passion for teaching? Well, maybe let's get very personal. It probably starts with the family because hmm. my father was a teacher, my mom a teacher, my first sister a teacher, my second sister a teacher, my third sister a teacher. <laughs> and you know, really? I, I, I was an engineer, there was something <laughs> wrong with me, right? <laughs> so when I was doing my career with PNG, I started being a, a trainer 
on top of my job, you know, it was just, you know, something additional. And then uh, little by little, I had the first opportunity to teach at a business school. Then it became three, then it became five. Now I'm teaching in 15 business schools. So that yeah. really keeps me busy in addition to a number of corporate customers across the world. So that's uh, really, I'm now living my passion, you know, really uh, in negotiation and influencing is something that uh, I enjoy very much. Wow. And, so now let's jump right into, today, into today's topic because we said we're going to talk about collaborative negotiations. What does that mean for you when we say collaborative negotiations? Well, there are a number of synonyms for this. You know, probably the most used one is win-win negotiation, you know, yeah. and uh, the, that's common user, but they're also called integrative negotiation, uh, you know. You may, uh, you may also talk about creating value is the idea that rather than being in opposition with the other person, you work with the other party to make it a better deal for both parties. So instead of fighting against or resisting, you're, it's almost like the both of you are on the same side? Well, I think, you know, you're both trying to solve the same problem. Okay, exactly. nicely now, said. At the end of the day, you still, uh, you know, in a business context, you're still paid by your company and the other part is still paid by the other company. So, you know, you have to defend the interest of the other, of your own company, of course. But, you know, rather than doing it to win over the other is really the day of say, okay, how can we make it maybe uh, good for them and great for us, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. You know, so you think about how to make it good for them, but then of course, you know, you also want to make sure that is really good for you. So that's sure. really the idea, yeah. So if we think about building the right context to have this collaborative negotiation, what is the attitude needed in your opinion? Well, I would say start by not being in a hurry, right? Okay. You know, you take the time to connect mm-hmm. with the other person. You know, you have some small talk, but right. you know, building the relationship is something which is very important yeah. because that's create the basis for more collaboration, for sharing information, yeah. asking questions, listening. You know, these are all the elements that you want to make sure that you have to put the discussion, the negotiation on the right track. Okay. And sometimes, by the way, Many people associate negotiation with uh, a negative word, you know, in the mind of yeah. many people, you know, negotiation is the confrontational part. So maybe sometime not talking about negotiation, but talking, you know, let's have a meeting, let's have a discussion is probably a more positive way to even use the word as opposed to associate the word of negotiation that makes a few people scared or yeah. uh, associate negative uh, Uh, Absolutely. Because when I hear you say that, take more time, I mean, my gosh, it's so simple. And yet when I hear that, so like, like say you were coaching me and I was going to have a negotiation, Amy, take your time that I could see how that would already start to take pressure off me. And I wouldn't be as attached to driving my agenda. I, and I would slow down. I could, like you said, I can imagine I would want to spend more time building the rapport, which as you and I both know, that's a way to show respect and interest in the person. And it makes it harder for that person to want to resist when they're feeling respected. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. it really starts with the relationship. It really starts with building trust. It really starts with building rapport. You know, all those elements are key to facilitate the rest. So you just, you mentioned a key word, trust. So, and we often talk about trust, although each of us may have a different recipe for trust. From your experience, what is needed to be seen as being trustworthy to the counter, to our counterpart? Yeah, I, th- I agree with you that indeed, you know, people associate different ideas. Now, I use uh, the trust equation in maybe a way, maybe for our listener, to structure a bit the topic of trust with four key ideas. You know, the trust equation says that trust is made of, in the upper part of the equation, there is credibility plus reliability plus intimacy. Okay, hold on. Credibility, reliability. Reliability and intimacy. 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 And on the lower part of the equation, there is self-orientation. So the self-orientation has a negative impact on the trust, while the credibility, reliability, and intimacy 
have a positive impact. Now, let me define those four terms so, so okay. that uh, you know, we go, can make it easy for people. Go slower because I, this you're giving us just these golden nuggets and I want to make sure that listeners, they're able, it's sinking in for them. Okay. Exactly. So positive impact on trust, credibility. Credibility means that uh, you are someone who is professional, who knows the market, who knows the business, with whom I can have uh, a professional discussion and you know what you're talking about, right? The phrase that comes to me is you say, you do what you say you're going to do. That's the next one. That's okay. the reliability part. Oh, got the it. Reliability, the second, so the credibility is really being competent. It's okay. about, you know, being competent. You can do the, the job. Second, exactly, do the job. The reliability is walking the talk. Okay. Keeping your promises. Okay. The reliability is, you know, you tell to your boss, uh, I'm going to send you the report on Friday. And indeed, you know, the report is uh, arrives on Friday. The salesperson that sells to the customer, the goods will arrive on Tuesday and the goods really arrive on Tuesday. You know, that's uh, the reliability element. Okay. Third element, intimacy. Intimacy looks at the quality of the relationship how comfortable you feel to have a discussion with this person. Mm. Also, when you talk about problem, also when you're talking about, you know, something which is more challenging. So yeah. these are the three elements which are strongly correlated with positive trust with, with the other party. And I can see how if you, if even just one of those is missing, the trust is shot. Because if I've got somebody in front of me who, I know can do the job. I, you know, they hear she, she says that they do what they say they're going to do, except I don't feel safe with them. I don't trust that person. Yeah. And, and plus the same thing is if they're really nice, except they're not so competent in their work and you know, it just, it falls apart. Exactly. So I can see exactly. where you have to have these three pillars. Exactly. Mm. And then, you know, the, the lower part of the trust equation, so the things which have a negative impact on trust is a self-orientation. Okay, what does that self mean? What do I mean, you know, if you approach the negotiation, then you only care about your own interest, then uh, I will have difficulty to trust you. Yeah. Now, of course, you know, you are paid by your own company, you want to do what is right, but let's keep in mind that, you know, you also want to make sure that the other party also goes out of the negotiation feeling good. Right. Uh, that they've made their interest. So, you know, if you're a self-oriented person, I'm not going to trust you. If instead you're the kind of person that takes into account the interest of both parties and does their best, you know, to make sure that you're also satisfied, that's uh, is going to be something positive for uh, trust. So let's say I've been given feedback that my negotiation skills, Amy, you're competent, you're reliable, you're, um, you know, you make yeah, good connection, the intimacy, right? Yet you're self-focused. What's the term you use? Self- Self-oriented. Interest, yeah. self-oriented. So how could I learn to become less self-oriented? I think then, you know, we are at the level of uh, the personal value and the personality and the character of the people. Mm. So it's not so much something that uh, you can teach. Probably that's you know, the kind of things that you learn more into a coaching session, mm -hmm. like the one that you give, you know, you get people, you know, to think differently right. than in a training session, because in a training session, people will, uh, yeah, will absorb the concept, but then when they go back to their daily life, then uh, if they have a mindset, you know, if they've been brought uh, with uh, a mindset, which is, uh, okay, there are limited resources and I have to grab my share of those limited resources. Yeah. Then of course, you know, in spite of the training, when they go back to the negotiation table, their own uh, uh, way of seeing the world may come back. And in that respect, that's where... Uh, you know, the coaching, the mentoring are yeah. the kind of things that are going to help. Maybe, you know, you do, there are a few tricks that you use uh, yeah. with your, your, your people when uh, you see that, you know, they struggle with trust. Uh, is there something maybe that, that you will do more in a coaching environment? Thank you for asking because 
I ha something's popping up my mind and it may, it may be like, well, that might work sometimes, or it's going to feel very manipulative. I don't know. You tell me, I feel like if I have, if I'm coaching someone who's uh, tends to be self-interested, I would encourage them to, as a very direct way to take the focus off themselves and put it on the other person is ask questions about that other person. Does that feel like some, an approach that could work? C certainly, it signals uh, uh, the right message. You know, I, I think, you know, the self-oriented person is more likely to be talking most of the time right. and don't want to push forward their own idea. So indeed, asking questions mm. is a way. Then, of course, mm -hmm. he has to be combined with the listening. Right, because, right. You know, if you ask the question, but Darn then, you know, when the person is talking, <laughs> they're already preparing the reply, yep. then of course, you know, it doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The reason I was asking, um, I don't know if you know this exercise. Um, it's, it goes by different names. I think it's the orange. Uh, sometimes it goes by the, the coconut crisis is my when my sister developed uh, the, the game. And so you have two counterparts and um, the, and each person is set up to be a little bit, you know, they think the other person is a little self-interested and it turns out that they have positive intentions of helping burn victims and the other ones to help children who are homeless or something like that. And the, when people, you put them into this negotiation conversation and the, there's an insanely simple solution and the people who get it are the ones that ask questions. And I'm shocked how many executives I work with who do the exercise and they never get to the solution because they didn't ask the questions. And they were constantly attached to what they wanted and it was push, 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 push and insist. Yeah. Yeah, so you know what, without giving yeah, it away, yeah, you know that, yeah, 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 it's, yeah, it's yeah, fascinating, yeah. isn't it? Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. Absolutely. If anybody wants um, to know what that game is, uh, email me and I will be, be happy to share with you. It's a great exercise to, to do in with uh, leaders. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, so um, let me now ask you then, what are some of the key principles to be followed during these collaborative negotiations? Well, maybe let me start with a classic, right? You know, there is the best selling, the best selling book in the history of negotiation is called The Getting to Yes. Yep. And this book outlined the four key principles that are important for collaborative negotiations. So probably a good starting point, maybe, you know, starting from what, you know, Fisher and Uri have already defined. Excellent. And, you know, the first one is about separating people from the problem. Okay. So the idea is, you know, you don't, make it a personal things mm. you know we are trying to solve a problem but it's not amy's fault it's not bill's fault it's not Margaret's fault is you know okay we have a problem and we want to try to solve it you don't make it a personal matter right nice and what are some of the guidelines to avoid making things personal i guess the first is realizing if you're making it personal so i'm accusing someone of being the problem? <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm curious. What you, you, you must have some no. examples when you're coaching people on, you know, you're doing negotiations and, and examples where they slip right into that, I imagine. Yeah, well, uh, let's face it, you know, in real life, sometimes you end up dealing with difficult people, right? So yeah. you may say, okay, you may want to try to say, well, no, there is a problem, et cetera, this is not with the person, but, you know, you may <laughs> feel that, you know, yes, he's the person, he's the person who's creating the problem. But, uh, um, you know, sometimes it's also a matter of, uh, of mindset. Uh, whenever we start labeling somebody as difficult, we are contributing to the problem. Okay. Uh, let me share a, a real life story, right? Please. Uh, we, we had a problem with one of the contract manufacturer at the company that was uh, not respecting the quality standards. Yeah. And the, the vice president of quality wanted to completely stop working with them. Although, you know, from a business point of view, this was really a problem. We didn't have an alternative. We didn't even have another way to supply medicine to the people in that country 
because he was the only supplier that was uh, qualified. Now, you know, if you take just the business hat, you may say, hey, you know, my, oh, my, this guy's been so difficult, you know, he doesn't understand, he doesn't have a business sense, etc., etc." Now, one of the key elements in negotiation is, uh, is what they call dual vision. You know, looking dual? at the deal from dual vision. Dual, dual vision. vision. So okay. Looking at the deal from both sides. Okay. Now, if you take the perspective of the other person, yeah. and you realize that if there is a problem, is the quality guy that goes to jail is not the commercial guy who goes to jail. Then you start, you know, empathize more for the quality guy, and you may understand why, you know, he may be less flexible than us uh. because, you know, there is a. Is it, when you realize that they may go to jail for that, right? Then uh, uh, you understand that, yeah, maybe it's not so difficult like uh, I had uh, quickly uh, anticipated, right? And uh, and then of course, you know, the other element that comes into play is the emotions. You know, when the situation gets difficult and the people get emotional, then of course it becomes more difficult to go right. into a collaborative negotiation to be able to re retain control. So before we go more into that, because I think that when things get emotional, I think that's very interesting for listeners to hear more about that. Going back to this example with the, the guy who could potentially go to jail. Um, what I heard in that example is your that famous philosophy in life of put yourself in the other person's shoes. And, and then what happens suddenly is, oh, well, of course he would be defensive. Of course he's resisting. That's a scary thing. That's, that's a big problem. So you're, what I hear through my lens is that you're finding empathy to explain why the person, or, or you're accessing empathy, um, which is helping you to relate to that person yeah. and making it more difficult to stay difficult with that person when, when we have empathy for each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Nice. I talk about perspective taking, you know, yes, having the opportunity to understand the perspective of the other party that is going to help you then, you know, to uh, realize how those people are answering that way. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so then this next piece um, you started talking about was the emotional element. Say more about that. Cause I think that's pretty juicy for people. Oh, well, um, I think, you know, whenever you're, di you're in a difficult situation, a difficult situation, different people or whatever you want to call it, a difficult conversation, uh, the first reaction should really to remain calm. Yeah. That's, uh, you know, uh, because uh, after, maybe, you know, if the other person is aggressive, is angry, etc., afterwards, you're going to care about them and try to get them to calm down. Mm -hmm. The first point is you remaining calm. Yeah. And, uh, and then, you know, people may do it in different way. And maybe people may, you know, I know, I know that uh, one of the techniques is to count, count to yeah. 10. Or yep. count to 100 if you're really angry. <laughs> yeah, whatever it no, takes. You know, 000. Some people, you know, breathe deeply mm -hmm. just, uh, to, just uh, to regain their concept. Maybe sometime you can anticipate that this is going to happen. You yes. know, maybe you forgot your wife's birthday. Maybe you forgot. Uh, maybe you, you promised that you want to go be, be home by 8 o'clock for a dinner with friends and you arrive at 9 o'clock. Yeah. And... Uh, you can anticipate this and then you, know, you can prepare mentally about the fact that, you know, there is going to be an emotional reaction from the other side. Yeah. And then, you, know, you can uh, take it. Like, Sometimes, you know, you may decide to change the perspective. You know, you look at the emotional reaction from the other person, maybe as a sign that they care. No, oh, gorgeous. Or maybe as an indication that you can understand better the interest of the other party mm. based on the kind of reaction that what matters to them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But then, you know, it may become even more for sophisticated, like uh, learning to recognize your emotional uh, uh, the Triggers. body reaction, the body reaction, you know, yeah. people will have a different part of the body that uh, 
you know, mm. sweating hands, heartbeat increasing, the breathing going, becoming faster. So if you learn to recognize those elements nice. in your own body, then you may say, oh, oh, I'm losing control. Yeah. Let's pay special attention because otherwise, you know, I may end up reacting in a way yeah. which is suboptimal. Yeah. What I would add to what you just said is it what you said at the very beginning of take time. So already the taking time is going to reduce the likelihood of you getting having an emotional reaction. Then if and when you do have the emotional reaction, the breathing or the counting. Um, and I'm always a big fan of making sure I've been fed and watered before any kind of deli potentially delicate conversation, especially a negotiation. <laughs> <laughs> right? Exactly. And, and then you're also, what I hear you describing, Giuseppe, is having uh, upgrading our emotional intelligence to, um, uh, to make up a story as to why someone might be upset um, that, that explains and, and in a positive way that has good intention. You're looking for the positive intention. And that's helping you to be less reactive while helping to advance the conversation. That's, um, hey, listen, I, I want to um, pause for a moment here because we're going to take a break in just a moment. And when we come back, Giuseppe, I would love to hear more about these key principles for the collaborative negotiations. And listeners, if you want to connect with Giuseppe, you have two ways to do that. You can find him on LinkedIn and you'll look for Giuseppe Conte. That's G-I-U-S-E-P-P-E-C-O-N-T-I, -E -E Giuseppe Conte, or go directly to his website, C-A-B-L dot C-H, and you can find out more about him. Stay tuned. You're listening to Partner Up with Amy Carroll on the Voice America Business Channel. Welcome back to Partner Up with Amy Carroll. My guest today is Giuseppe Conte, and he's a professor in negotiation and influencing. And we've been talking about collaborative negotiations. So Giuseppe, before the break, we started talking about these key principles for collaborative negotiations and the importance of managing your mindset when you've got a difficult person, making up another reason why they might be difficult or upset um, and how to have a greater emotional intelligence for them. So I'll let you continue with the other key principles for collaborative negotiations. I think there's three more. Three more, absolutely, okay. yeah. Good. The second one is about differentiating interest from position. Focus on interest, not position. So what do we mean with that? And uh, the image that I like is the image of the iceberg. Okay. So the, the position is what is visible, what the people are telling you. Amy, I want a 10% raise. Okay. Right? You know, That's if you're my boss, I'm going to come and ask you for a 10% raise, right? That's the position. The interest is what is below the water, oh. you know, the iceberg, you know, the big part of the iceberg, which may not be visible. Now, uh, why interest give you a much broader perspective on the deal? Because let's say that, you know, there are different direct reports that are asking for this 10% raise. Right. Maybe um, Amy is asking for the 10% raise because she heard that another colleague got a 10% raise and she wants a 10% raise. Mm -hmm. And maybe Bill is asking for a 10% raise because uh, his wife got a raise and he wants to also to, <laughs> to get a raise. Maybe... Uh, Margarita is asking for a 10% raise because she has a very expensive lifestyle and she's spending all the money and she needs to raise in order to get to the end of the month. Maybe in this COVID time, it's a bit more difficult to spend more, more money outside, but you know, in normal times, that's maybe will, will the case. And maybe you know, there is a John who is asking for the 10% raise because he's doing a lot of work and he's not getting any words of praise. So he doesn't understand whether the boss really appreciates the work or not. And that's why he's asking for the raise. Now you may see that the position is the same. I want a 10% raise, right. but the underlying different interests are very different. And it may broaden the number of solutions to satisfy your interest. It may have nothing to do 
with the initial request of, of the 10% race. Okay. You know, maybe, you know, the last example, the person may be looking for recognition more than about the race. Right. So that's what the power of interest is that it, may, it broadens the number of solutions that we have available. Nice. And that seems to go back to the on, sometimes the only way to find that out is ask questions, show curiosity and interest. Because if we jump to conclusions too quickly, we may not find the other solutions. Exactly. In mm. fact, without question, you can only make assumption. And that's not the solution. No. So maybe you can make some hypothesis to say, well, you know, Having worked with this person in the past, recognizing this, I believe this person may be interested in X, Y, Z. But then you test your hypothesis. While the assumption is, I know what they want. I know this guy is Italian, so he wants this, this, and that. I know this guy is Japanese, so all Japanese are like this. I know that she's a female, and so, so what she wants, you know. These are all the kind of mistakes that we make by applying stereotypes and by pretending that we understand the other person while well, we're just, you know, not doing this. So asking question is indeed the way to get the understanding Got it. to make sure also that you get answers to your question, mm. which is not always easy. Yeah. No. Yeah. And that's, it's, it might be, I'm guessing a matter of asking the question a couple of times or different ways. And I don't know, I'm, be curious. Well, I think one of the skills I've heard with negotiation and I teach people as far as when they're having difficult or delicate conversations is using lots of silence mm -hmm. to allow that other person to respond. Yes. Now, silence is, is a powerful way to get more information. We just have to be careful that silence is a competitive technique. So, I cannot use silence too often. You know, okay. I can use silence once, but you know, if I keep playing the silence game all the time, then uh, it's going to be unlikely that you're really going to like the conversation with me. Got it. So right. it is one of the tools that you, now if you want to get more answer, maybe it can also be something like, you know, nodding your head and say, huh, okay, I, I see. Okay, interesting. Tell me more. Right, mm -hmm. you know, so... If you're, if you're getting an answer which is not fully satisfactory, then you can indeed play this uh, uh, fact of, of, of making a small question. You can ask a follow-up question, right? Uh, then you, know, you get uh, an answer which is very generic, and then you go into a probing question when you go more in details to find out what uh, uh, you want. Yeah. And, and probably, you know, my favorite, in order to get more information, yeah. is avoid the police interrogation. You know, some people say you have to ask questions, and then they go and say, "Well, but can you tell me this? And what was? And what is behind this? And what?" And, and then you know, it doesn't feel good. No. So if you want to make it a collaborative, let's say that you give me a piece of information, then my attitude will be, "Okay, well, that's interesting, you know, and I can understand, like, for a, a medium-sized company like yours, this may be relevant. But help me understand, yeah, why is you you are specifically asking for a three years contract? You see, I put a piece of word, I reflect on what I just listened, right, and then I have my second piece of question. But it it sounds much better than you know if you're just hammering me with a series of questions sure. one after yeah. the other. And I like what you said earlier about don't use silence in a intimidating or manipulative way. Um, and also, like you said, one phrase, um, you know, would you tell me more? That's delightful and inviting for people. I think. Yeah. Because yeah, they don't exactly. feel that pressure. It's just, a, it's an invitation. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I want uh, to go tell you a third principle. The good. Third tell principle. me. <laughs> let's do a rewind of where we're at. We are number three. So, number one, you know, separate the people from the pub. Number two, focus on interest and on position. Number three, generate creative options. Okay. Uh, what, what is the idea behind this? That, you know, we may have a problem, right? And, uh, the typical attitude may be, okay, I know what's the solution to the problem. We have to do it this way. 
uh, if you want to work in a collaborative negotiation, it's more like, okay, let me think about, okay, that's the problem, but uh, what kind of solution are available over there? What are some of the things which uh, are possible over there that may help us, you know, to solve the problem? Uh, you know, let's say that uh, Harvard invites me to teach. Yeah. But then they tell me, sorry, Giuseppe, we cannot fly you business class and we can only pay you a small amount of money. Yeah. You say, oh, well, you know, that's really a pity, right? You know, but, but then you say, wait a moment, you know, teaching at Harvard, you know, will be an amazing experience. You know, it's right. not really about the money. There are other things. And maybe, you know, there are other things that we can do. Maybe you can negotiate that uh, they give you a fancy title. Maybe mm. you can negotiate that, you know, they're going to put you on their website, yeah. on their newsletter to the alumni and they're going to build about your brand. Maybe they're going to refer you also, you know, to Stanford, to MIT, to Yale, etc. And then, you know, you may end up building other uh, productive relationships, etc. Et so you see, you know, uh, if I approach the discussion with Harvard and say, oh, you know, I want 100, no, I want 150, 100, 150, etc. You know, right. then uh, I'm just... Uh, going for a confrontation or well, what I really want is to collaborate with Harvard. Right. But if I have this approach of saying, okay, let me look for creative solutions as well. I understand that you are constrained in terms of budget and you can only pay a hundred. Let's look, I mean, maybe there are a few things that we can work out together that will still get me to my goal, you know, right. having a collaboration and having a satisfactory agreement, but uh, maybe the solution, maybe not uh, the one that we originally thought, but it's something that we create together with the other party. And what I love about that is, to me, it demonstrates uh, um, resilience. Not, it's not really exactly resilience. It demonstrates to me a healthy ego because you're not feeling defensive or disappointed. Well, no, it has to be this way. No, there's this, you're willing to step into the unknown and limbo and the discomfort, and which is also a, an opportunity for a space to be curious and open and in saying, okay, what options do we have? And that to me also takes a certain level of emotional intelligence to be willing to step into that space. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, uh, in, you know, it also builds back to the point number two about focus on interest and not position. And uh, if I approach uh, the discussion with Harvard and I focus on position, this is, I want to go and teach at Harvard and I want to be paid 150. Right. Right. You know, now another way to say I focus on interest is I want to teach at Harvard and I want to protect my market value. Mm -hmm. So I cannot... Uh, sell to Harvard at 100, if I'm selling to everybody else at 150, mm -hmm. but you know, I can protect my market value and I can look for another way to look for a package which is 150, that is, which has a value 150, but maybe you know, 100 is gonna be money. And then, you know, there will be some fringe benefits. There will be some uh, uh, opportunity to do other business, maybe an, uh, a preferential access to a Harvard Business School Review article and those kind of things. You've and thought you this say, through, well, this no, is good. That's, you know, that's, you know, that's really, yeah, that will be uh, a value of 150, even if they cannot right. pay me 100 in terms of cash, right? Right, right. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah. So, so um, do you feel, uh, do we cover the three then completely? The three, no, we still have a fourth one. Oh, good. Okay. And the and fourth Bonus. and last one is about, yeah. you know, objective criteria. What this principle says is uh, you're going to be more persuasive and you're also going to build a more, uh, a better relation with the other party if you use fact-based objective criteria. So, which means as much as possible, I talk about something that the other party can verify. Because too often in negotiation, we say, oh, you know, uh, you're too expensive. Oh, there is someone else that is better than you. You know, whatever, you know, we make those kind of arguments, yeah. but there is no substance and there is no way for the other party to validate it. Now, uh, a more effective way is to use objective criteria. 
then I can say, you know, according to the market indicator plots, then the market has dropped by 10 cents. Or, you know, there is a new plant coming off stream in Saudi Arabia. This is changing the supply demand of the market. So we are going to see a downward trend into the price for the coming months. You know, so whenever you make your argument, which are based on solid facts, your arguments are stronger than if you just base them on, uh, you know, hypothesis, on mm -hmm. uh, assumption, on things that the other party cannot verify. And my sense is that there, that takes a certain amount of commitment to doing your homework, your research, to finding that out. Absolutely. So, yeah. you know, being well prepared, in fact, you know, is the essence of negotiation. So, you know, if I have to say maybe two things that are very important in negotiation yeah. is perspective taking and preparation. So mm -hmm. this idea of what I call dual vision is approaching the deal, looking at the perspective of both sides. Okay. And the second, you know, taking time for preparation, doing your research, put your uh, preparation in writing. And that's uh, something that's certainly going to help you, you know, to have a much more fruitful negotiation. Yeah. And it's, you know, I'm really appreciating as we're going through this, all of the different elements that it takes to be successful in a negotiation. Yeah. You know, that there's a, there's a lot that you can control for and not leave to chance. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, uh, and uh, you know, he, uh, he also, sometimes he needs to be, you need to be proactive to do it well. Mm -hmm. Because uh, guess what? What is really happening is that, he, uh, you know, just an example from, uh, fr from yesterday. Okay. Uh, one of my workshop participants, um, uh, an American executive told me, listen, but how can I find the time to prepare? You know, my agenda is filled back to back with one meeting after the other, one meeting after the other, right? So, yes, there is, this is the reactive side. You know, there is somebody else that is blocking your agenda, is invite you to meetings, then you're just running from one meeting to the other, and then you're going to go there, meet your supplier, meet your customer, and just try to come up with the best idea that is going to come to your head at that moment. Yeah, you're now, leaving things instead, to chance. You know, it takes it to be proactive to say, okay, preparation is important. So I have to block some time in my agenda mm. because I'm going to discuss, you know, a 10 million deal here. I cannot have a discussion about a 10 million deal just trying to uh, find a solution on the spot. I do have to take some time for the research. I do have to time for preparation. And that's what you do in order to uh, then approach the negotiation in the right way. Yeah. What happens when the two parties have different interests and priorities? Well, <laughs> it may sound counterintuitive, this one, Amy. But when the parties have different interests and priority, it's a great opportunity in negotiation. Huh. <laughs> that because, does you know, sound counterintuitive. <laughs> you know, we tend to think, okay, you know, when we see the things in the same way, we have the same interests, the same the commonality, we went to the same school, etc. You know, that's that's the way it works. And of course, you know, it, it absolutely, you know, the similarity and the things are important, you know, to build the rapport with the other person. But in negotiation, when we have different interesting, that's the greatest opportunity to create value. Uh, let, let's be concrete. If uh, for you, having a long-term contract is very important and uh, the insurance is not very important, is one thing. Now, if vice versa for me, the insurance is very important and the long-term contract is not, then we can make a trade. Got it. So that we can agree that you have the long-term contract and I have the insurance mm -hmm. and we can both be happier. Interesting. Well, you know, whenever we value the same thing, if for both of us, the, the contract length was important and the insurance was not, we will be fighting because we both want the same thing. But whenever we value different things, that's where we can make the best possible deal. Mm -hmm. Got it. And how do we discover the interests and priorities? of our counterpart, for example. Then I will say, 
you know, starting open-ended question is probably a strong starting point, right? You okay. know, it's something that enables us, you know, to discover a bit more. Makes sense. Then, you know, the open-ended question is a starting point. Uh, maybe, you know, I can signal collaboration by starting to share some information. Because, you know, if I'm only asking you, but I'm never giving, then of course, you know, it doesn't feel very good. Right. Maybe we can use our active listening skills. We can paraphrase and therefore, you know, feedback the information to the other yeah. party and make sure that they get it right. Yeah. Maybe like you were mentioning before, we can ask the same question in different ways. We can triangulate the information and try to see whether, you know, we really understood what mm -hmm. the other party says is not. Maybe we can ask a more in-depth question. Well, uh, maybe, you know, why this is important to you? What is behind this request? Mm -hmm. Or maybe we can have a exploration kind of things. You know, what uh, if we make it uh, a collaboration on a global basis rather than only looking at this region? And then, you know, you can explore things. Maybe we can give a different option to the other person that have the same value to you. Then, you know, you give them three options and this, you know, helps you to understand what are the things that the other party values more or less. So, wow. yes, there is a variety of techniques so much. That are there. And uh, you know what? Most of the people approach the negotiation and they say, okay, it's a poker game. I have to keep the cards close right. to my chest. And uh, I'm not going to reveal anything because right. they're going to take advantage of me. Yeah. But of course, you know, if I don't reveal, you don't reveal, then uh, how do I know what is important to you? How do you know what right. is important to me? Now, of course, you know, the information sharing is a critical part because, of course, if I reveal and you do not reveal, you may like to take advantage of me. Right. And that that's a risk. And though I have to say that that was one of the first things you gave us an example is be willing to share information. And uh, yes, if you have people with good intentions, um, often that will work really well, but that will probably increase trust because they think, okay, this person knows what they're, they're willing to um, reveal things about themselves that they're, they're confident. And that's a sign of respect in the other person often. Now with that other person, um, what's the word I want when they um, reciprocate in the same way, you're right. There's no guarantee though. That to me is a, a, a wonderful approach to building trust is being willing to reveal things about ourselves. Yeah. Let mm -hmm. me tell you a bit more about the information sharing because you know, it's one of those areas where there is not a lot uh, a lot of articles, uh, a lot of literature on this topic. So I think that uh, we may give a few hints uh, to, okay. the, to the readers. Okay, so first of all, I mentioned about this idea that you may even want to start the information sharing process because the research tells us, you know, that uh, that's not uh, a big issue. But you may even start with something small, which has nothing to do with the negotiation. To show you that I trust you, I may say, oh, you know, I started my day with uh, some sport this morning. You know, you may see the sport machine on the back uh, of my screen because, yes. you know, that's, you know, so it starts telling something about yourself. You may say, I, uh, you know, I didn't sleep well because my kid was crying, you know. So you may start sharing some information at a personal level just to signal to the other person that you trust. But then, you yeah. know, when we start getting to the professional information, I give two key advice. The information sharing should be incremental and reciprocal. So, right. So don't let, just let share. I blah, blah, blah. give you a piece of information, yep. and then I ask you a piece of information. You give me a piece of information, then I give you a bit more. Yeah. You give me a bit more, and we build together a tower, a pyramid, which is yeah. going to be solid. Yeah. Now, if I share a piece of information and I discover that you are not willing to share, you yeah. want to take advantage of me, you have, uh, you know, this uh, mindset that, you know, there are limited resources and I want to grab them all, then I realize that uh, I cannot have this type of collaboration with you. And then, you know, I only share the small piece right. of information. I, I'm not taking advantage. Yeah. And you haven't, the risk hasn't been huge. 
And exactly. you've learned information. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. Giuseppe, sadly, we are running out of time. And I have like all these other questions I still have in the back of my mind, though I would, um, I understand you said to me that you had prepared a gift for listeners. I would love to hear more about that. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I put together a negotiation pack. Ooh. What I mean, a negotiation pack is, you know, a number of things that may be useful to the readers. Uh, you know, we talked about the importance of preparation. So I put there a negotiation preparation template. So people can oh, have a document super. that's in Excel that they can feel, you know, to get prepared because sometimes, you know, yeah, I have to prepare, but I don't know how to do it. So it says, okay, let's negotiation preparation template. Uh, I, uh, we didn't touch on the topic of gender, but it's one of the passion. I have put in the pack, for instance, also an article that I wrote for the Financial Times about how women can ask for a raise. Yes. Oh, you know, okay. I thought, you know, that this is, you know, one of the challenges. And, you know, you may have a number of female listeners here and, you yes. know, they may enjoy, you know, reading this article about Fantastic. asking for a raise. And then, you know, there are slides, there are okay. other videos, articles, etc. You know, there's something about virtual negotiation, etc. So that oh, great. Okay, can, good. Uh, can get this. Yeah, that's it. Uh, Hopefully okay, wonderful. Useful. So then um, I'm going to give a call for action. And that first call for action is... Listeners, email me for the link to get Giuseppe's free negotiation pack, and I will send it to you, and you'll be able to enjoy that article along with everything else that's in that juicy giveaway. And uh, Giuseppe, what about for you? What is your one call for action for listeners? Well, I think we talked about collaborative negotiation and reading the book, Getting to Yes. Getting Maybe, to yes. probably, you know, exactly the, the best, uh, the best thing, you know, if you're interested in this topic, uh, you know, it's not by chance that it's the best selling yeah. book in the history of negotiation. Exactly. Authors are Roger Fisher and William Urey. Yes, absolutely. And my second call for action for listeners is feel free to send me your communication conundrums, clashes, challenges, mishaps, blunders and your success stories. You can do that via email or social media. And I will read them, discuss them on future shows, make suggestions. My email is amy at carolcoaching.com. That's two R's and two L's. Now, if you want to reach out and connect with Giuseppe, remember you can get to him via his website, cabl.ch or on LinkedIn. And that's Giuseppe Conte, G-I-U-S-E-P-P-E-C-O-N-T-I. Now, next week, be sure to tune in because I'm going to be interviewing Matthias Harmon, who is a somatic coach. In fact, he calls himself the coach to call when life is calling for change. <laughs> and we're going to dive into his embodied approach to dig deep into internal blockages of change. If you're game for more, I'm going to be hopping over to a Facebook Live five minutes past the hour for a short chat on today's call. Feel free to connect with me on my social media channels, Amy Carol Coaching, or check out my website, carolcoaching.com. And you also, another call for action, check out uh, also Giuseppe's website, because aside from the article in the packet he, you're going to be accessing or able to access he also has loads of content on his website that you're going to want to take advantage of. Giuseppe, thank you. It's been a wonderful conversation. It was my pleasure, Amy. And Real thank pleasure. you. Thank you to the listeners. You've been listening to Partner Up with Amy Carroll on the Voice America Business Channel. Happy partnering, everyone.